Dorks and Forks is brought to you by His and Hers Couples Boutique, located on Kirkwood Highway, Wilmington, Delaware. Hi, welcome to the Blackthorn Grove podcast. My name is Amy Blackthorn. This is a podcast where witchcraft and good friends meet over tea to talk about nature of magic and our community. Today, I'll be talking about where our magic comes from, how we can connect with practitioners in our community that aren't of our community. When we have separate traditions, when we have separate feelings about how we each approach the numinous in our own way. There's, there's been some divisiveness, and I want to make sure that this podcast focuses on bridging those gaps and bringing people together. So we'll have some reviews, we'll talk about tea, and we'll talk with our lovely guest this week, Eerie Twilight. Hi, Amy. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming. This, uh, For those of you who are listening, this is our very first episode. Eerie is one of my most adored people. She's so talented and the amount of things that she does, you, you you just can't keep up. I don't know how you keep up with it. I' pretty sure I need, we need to get you an intern. I think the same thing when I see all of your amazing endeavors. Well, thank you so much. Aren't you a sweetie? For those of you who aren't familiar with my work, I'm the author of Blackthorn's Botanical Magic, uh, as well as Sacred Smoke to Clear Away Negative Energies and Purify Body, Mind, and Spirit uh, that came out this uh, last October. I've been described as an arcane horticulturist because I've spent my life mixing plant energies and science, mixing herbalism and magic. So bringing all this stuff together gives me a unique perspective on medical science, how, do you, how to treat yourself medically with plants and materials, as well as how to use those energies to further your own magical goals, your energetic goals, your intentions. Um, my experiences in British traditional witchcraft give me a nice background for some of that to bring it all together. So I want to have lots of guests who come from different backgrounds and see where their, their magic takes them and where it can take us as a community. So today, what are we drinking here today, Erie? Uh, this is Blackthorn Hoodoo Blend's White Witch Tea. Oh, it's so fabulous. So White Witch has ginger and cream and almond in it. It was actually... I don't know if I've ever told you this. This was designed for The White Witch of Narnia. Ooh. The, Lion, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was one of my favorite books as a young adult. Being able to step out of your, your home, drive through the wardrobe, and encounter magic was really an incredible feeling for me as a young adult to be able to leave your own life behind and go and f- travel somewhere. So the almond is that very sweet Turkish delight because I am deathly allergic to roses. We don't, we don't have rose, no. <laughs> uh, but we also have ginger for her sharp personality and a nice creamy base for all of her white clothing. Yeah, and the notes of vanilla and like that, that sugary almondness definitely carry through the nose and the flavor. Like uh, This is perfect without sugar. You can't say that about very many things. <laughs> That's, that is true. I definitely want of a sweet tooth. I wanted to talk before we get too heavily into our history and where we, we meet. I want to talk about books real quick. So the idea of having a book review, I read and I've, I've always read. My house is full. You know, you've been in the house. There's a downstairs library. There's an upstairs library. There's books everywhere. But my most recent book dalliances were not witchcraft related, but they were. Uh, I needed something to clear my brain out while writing my third book, which we will be teasing you with very shortly, mm. uh, I really needed something to air out my brain. And so my dear friend Jana recommended these books by a woman named Sarah Piper, who, they are just incredible. So the Witches Rebel series was the first series. The second series is Tarot Academy. She's a fabulous person, and that her knowledge of tarot makes the hair on my arms stand up. And the way she incorporates it in a fictional way was entertaining and enlightening, and it makes it accessible to people. Not to mention, in the Witches Rebel series, the tarot deck that she used is one of my absolute favorite tarot decks. What deck is that? So she never mentions it by name, but you can I know from the images that she saw, it's the Deviant Moon tarot. Oh, you've given me a reading with that before. And it's so, it's dark, but it's 
thorough. And it's it's almost like Dali paintings and Hieronymus Bosch and they sort of meet in the middle in this mystical landscape that there's giant fish and skeleton crews and the the deck itself speaks so highly that I actually use it to diagnose uh, magical illnesses. You know, somebody comes to me and says, oh, someone put a curse on me. Let's find out if that's, so if there's a curse on you or if you just had to run a bad luck. A curse or an accident or are you, are you fucking yourself, friend? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. <laughs> uh, it's, it's important to me as a, as a reader to have that, not just knowledge of the tarot, but how to interact with a client, how to interact with somebody sitting across the card table. That's infinitely more difficult than it is to just learn 78 cards backwards and forwards. That's a lifetime study, but learning how to sit across the table from someone is an even more in-depth study of how people act, how they, how they receive each other. One of, my, one, of the, one of the tarot readings that had the most impact on me, and I will never forget this, I had a dear friend call and say, hey, I, I'm having some friends over. Would you like to come and do a tarot party at my house? Absolutely. You set me up somewhere private. You guys have your party over here. I'll be downstairs in the basement. We'll do readings. And one by one, people came down. I did two-page birth charts so people had something to chat about over the dip and in between conversations. And halfway through the night, a woman came down the stairs. She didn't want to be there. You could see right away she had this defensive posture and pinched cheeks. No one has to come down here. We can just hang out and talk about the weather so people think you got a reading and everything's fine. You know, there's no pressure here. We make sure everything is safe and away. And I never, ever let have two people bring a friend in the room. Nope, this is a doctor's office. You can wait outside. So she asked me a very vague question. She said, what's coming? Ooh. So I couldn't decide if she wanted more insight into what was going on or if she wanted to call me a liar to my face. So I laid out the cards and it was really fascinating. There was lots of cups and swords clashing against each other. Like she already knows what's happening. She knows and she's known for a long time. And she starts tapping her fingers on the table. She's rushing around and she's clenching her hands. And I looked at her hands and every single finger on every hand had at least two diamond rings on it. And my, my, my people are whispering in my ear. They said, that's a lot of guilt. And so I'm reading and I start gently talking around. Oh, you're going to have some, some time to yourself and some time to grow and nurture yourself. And by the time I finish this reading, the woman is clutching her arms and rocking shaking her head back and forth and saying, nope, you couldn't be more wrong. You couldn't, you couldn't be more wrong. Clutching herself. I said, oh, you know, I'm sorry. You feel that way? I'm, I'm not going to charge you. You have, a, you have a lovely evening. And she ran up the stairs as fast as she could and started screaming about how wrong I was. And she ran out the door. She slammed the door behind her. And her daughter comes down and says, I have no idea what happened. It's great. It turns out her, her sister-in-law, who the party was for, called me a week later. She said, I'm so sorry she acted that way. She tried to dissuade people from coming and seeing you and talking about intuition, whatever it was that you talked down in there. She made a scene that I feel really bad. I said, no, she had something going on. It's, everything's great. I'm fine. I had a lot of fun. That night when she got home, her husband had packed up that, his belongings and gone to live with the woman who he had been living with for 12, he had been seeing for 12 years. There was one diamond ring for every year that he had been with this other woman. It must have been a year later, she actually called me up to apologize and realized, hey, I knew what was going on. I didn't want to, didn't want to face it. I appreciate you trying to be gentle with me. But I never would have said, oh, he's, he's so cheating on you. Because that's, that's not how you interact and how you bring forth someone's highest good. If it was a friend, maybe I'd approached it differently, but not being a client. as gen gently as possible. But being able to make that connection across the table is so incredible, and the Deviant Moon really brings that to bear. So, yes, the Witches Rebel series by Sarah Piper. 
and the Tarot Academy books. Books one and two are currently out, and then book three will be out in August, I believe. Uh, you can find them on Amazon. Um, I really hope to have Sarah on the on the podcast at some point. She's an incredible writer, and she's a she's a machine. These books are coming out every couple months. So the one the second one came out in December or January, and the next one's coming out in March, and then one in August. So nice, strike when it's hot. Yes, nice she's job. incredible. Uh, they are they're magical, but they're also romance. So you get sexy times, and everybody wins. Bodice rippers of witchcraft. Yes, yes, mm. they are, and they're they're modern day, so you can really get into the feel. It's it's not the lady running away books from her mom's day. Sounds like fun. Absolutely. So, one of the things I want to talk to you about before we get into who you are and how amazing you are, okay. um, I want to talk about my this the segment we're going to call Thorn on My Side. Uh, one of the things that has gotten really popular, especially in Facebook groups, is to pass around memes that say, oh, it's 10 signs you were born as a witch. And they're supposed to be really empowering and it's all garbage. <laughs> uh, Something so, on the internet is garbage. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> um, I love that, that people want to give agency to young witches, to new witches, because there's so much bullshit gatekeeping that happens. We don't want that. There's, that's not a thing. But in putting that out and saying, oh, well, if you're super empathic and you love cats and you were born on a Tuesday, you're a witch. <laughs> Tuesday's child. It takes away the agency of the person. It says, well, I didn't, I don't feel this one thing, so I can't be a witch. And it, it really takes them down, not just down a peg, but it takes them outside of their practice. And they're new and they're, they're just budding little baby birds. <laughs> not haven't even flown the nest yet. And someone's telling them that if you don't meet these criteria, then you're not a witch. And because witchcraft is so personal, I really fear that things like this, even though they're meant to be light and cute and sweet and unicorns, that it really takes out something that we really need, which is that, that building us up. No matter where you are in your life, you can find the agency in magic at any point in your life, right? I mean, I agree. Um, I would uh, be wary of identifying too strongly with anything that crosses your desk on the internet. Yes. Uh, first, for the young young witches out there who don't feel quite witchy enough, uh, I would also say number two, it's not just based on wardrobe, but wardrobe is super fun. Yes. It's so good. You can have your gorgeous Morgana dresses and you can have your rich jeans. They, you, even on the same day, it doesn't, the witches don't make the witch. They just make the witch a little more fun. I mean, it's fun to be fancy about it. Absolutely. Whenever possible. Accessorizing is magical. It is. Um, I did have an experience uh, recently with a young very lovely lady that was decked out in many universal hexagrams, to which, of course, I go up and introduce myself with a, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And she was really sweet, but she just kind of looked at me blankly. And she was pretty enough, so it was fine. But also a part of me died that day, only for a moment. A lovely human. One of my, one of my favorite humans is a... She teaches yoga and she leads sound baths and she's really fabulous. I, she sends me a poster that she has had made, the stand-up kind you put outside your, your health fair booth to advertise her yoga practice. And in the very center of her pastel pink and, and teal ocean waves is a universal hexagram. And, and I said, is there something I, I don't know about you as a person? Have we missed a conversation? And she says, what do you mean? She, she found it in the clip art for whatever make your own banner website she was using. And I got to explain to her, I said, it's very lovely. I said, but you might get some questions you can't answer. I mean, that's some great 93 current shit, though, I must say. I'm, I'm glad that that is a thing that is real and that we, this is one of the realities that we share <laughs> as a collective. It's yes. very nice to say that. But 
Hmm. I mean, it is connecting with the universe, and it, it would is. be great if there was, you know, if, if she wanted to have that micro macro discussion. Like yoga, you know, is definitely a very important of important part of thelemic magic. You know, we do asana during Gnostic mass for mm. a while, and that position is terrible. <laughs> it's very short. Come to mass, check it out. Uh, there in how often is it? Is it monthly? Uh, monthly or twice a month sometimes. We've been trying to have occasions on Saturdays and Sundays because, you know, work schedules. And at Thalesis Oasis in Philadelphia. Yes, at Thalesis in Philadelphia. It's it's an incredible space. Uh, my dear guest, Erie, has been putting on shows there. It seems like for years, but I know it, it hasn't been that long. It's incredible. There's been art shows, and there's the Tarot John from last year. That we'll be having Tarot John again this year. Uh, last year we had James Boyle exhibit. Um, he recently did a Rider Waite Smith style rendition of, uh, well, the Rider Waite Smith Tarot deck, um, which is based out of Philadelphia. Um, it's amazing. I must say, gritty is the devil, and we are the devil, and gritty is us. And that's very the most Philadelphia thing. And also uh, cups or cheesesteaks because we eat our feelings. That's right. That's it's such a fantastic deck. If you've ever seen uh, the Smith Rider Weight, there's a version out there called the Gummy Bear Tarot, and it's it's amazing. I love it. Uh, the The Philadelphia Tarot has that same feeling to me as the Gummy Bear Tarot in the artwork and the colors and the way that it's all composed. It's beautiful, and I love it. And everyone should own a deck because so if you're whether you've, you're inside Philadelphia or you're outside the area you've ever seen, it's sunny in, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Like, there's there's magic there. Please check this out. It's definitely a beautiful thing, and uh, Will Smith definitely makes an appearance. But I won't give you too many more spoilers on that. You'll have to check it out for yourself. So, how did we meet? So, I started doing a show with burlesque and variety arts called Hexwork. And I saw your hilarious meme page on the internet. And I said, hey, would you mind sharing my show because you have a lot of reach? And hey, if you live anywhere near my show, I will give you some tickets to it and you should totally come because it's going to be fun. And fun it was. I'm now a sponsor of Hexwork and it has brought me the opportunity to engage with so many incredible artistic humans that I never ever would have met otherwise. Um, Mab just Mab just brings a, a smile to my face and a tear to my eye. She's just amazing. No matter what she's doing, um, the, the ukulele playing or everything that she does is just sparkles with magic. And I hadn't, I didn't put her together with her persona from the fairy festival. Oh, wedgie two cheeks. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, when I when I put two and two together, I, I had ridiculously awesome things happen in my brain. Uh, when is you when are you touring next? So we're starting a new show that will happen three times this year in Baltimore at Rituals, which is the perfect venue for us. It is uh, where the old wind up space used to be, okay. so it's a really cool space. You know Baltimore, yeah. Um, then we're doing the spring equinox at the Lysis Oasis. We're going to have a late in the afternoon Gnostic mass and send people out for an hour. And then we'll have some really hexy burlesque. Fantastic. For the occasion. Yeah. Uh, is anyone returning th for anyone who might be familiar with your work? Um, I believe that show wasn't fully cast yet, okay. but Masso Kiss is going to be in it. She is an amazing performer that does a lot of things in the mid Atlantic region. Uh, Clint Essential, the most adorable stage satyr, stage kitten, will be there. And, uh, with a little waggly tail. With his little waggly tail, and you will have a chance to give him a lap dance in the middle of the show in a competition-style format that gets really intense at the space. And uh, it's definitely something to be seen. Yes. Consent-based, sexy times. Incredibly consent-based, sexy times, but also incredibly sexy times, because yes. that's when you get when you have consent. Exactly. So, I want to get into getting to know you, how you are, and I find the best question for that is, who is your favorite fictional witch? So, the witch cinnamon 
that was in Dealing with Dragons, the okay. first main character from that series of books. I think her name was... I have to look it up. It's been a really long time. That's fantastic. But uh, she uh, elected to go and work for and get paid by a dragon so that she didn't have to marry some tool that her dad was trying to marry her to. <laughs> and, like, through this, had a huge series of adventures by which, you know, she became empowered. And, you know eventually did get married to somebody that she really liked just because he was just like, eh, and bothered her about it, and she just was like, fine. And She's I here for it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, she was here for it. She was only doing it because she wanted to in that case and, like, highlighted the terribleness of this idea that this is the path for you if you don't want that to be the path for you. Exactly. <laughs> There's only one path. There's a whole forest. It's fine. Yes, there's many trees in the grove. The grove has a lot of different meandering ways to go about it. Perfect. Mm. I get that question a lot. I do a lot of these interviews. You know, who are you? Where did you start? How did you, how did you come about? And it's so funny because I think we all, or at least I go through these phases of the different witches you see in cinema and how they reflect different parts of ourselves. Like Kim Novak in Bell Booking Candle is just dripping with sexy times. She's gorgeous and lithe. And this, the idea of the Bell and Candle that, that witches can't cry, you know, and she, the, and you see this beautiful close up of her face with one little single tear glittering down her cheek. And she's just gorgeous. And the whole family that comes along, it's very bewitched in, in the way that it was shot and the way the she interacts with her family, witches. but it's really dark and cinematic and, Piwack at the candle and all these really gorgeous close-ups of her emotive face. She's just perfect for uh, not just the idea of a witch any time, but for the era. The glamour, that like glamour witch, witch John that was going on for such a long time. Yes, opening up the, the cement in the ground and going down imaginary stairs into the witch beatnik bar. Everybody's wearing skinny jeans and little hats and everything's spectacular. I definitely want to live there. I mean, romantic times and travel. I'm sure that when you tour for your next book, you may be treated to some places with hidden staircases. Have you taken your book to London yet? I have not, but I definitely need to do that. Uh, I'm really excited about the Women in Magical Conference uh, in uh, South Kensington. It's a suburb of London. Anyone who's never been, South Ken is a really cute neighborhood. I, I love the way that it's that it feels, but it's also... You, can, you have line of sight access to the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. It's a very cute neighborhood. Everything is very walkable. So I really need to get there. Uh, a friend of mine told me about it last year, but on the day that they were stopping to accept their application. So I didn't have time to get something ready that minute. Um, so I definitely need to get there. I will definitely tell you how it is after I go this year. I'm so excited. And bring you the materials. Yes, I was very happy that my community pitched in to support me going there after and it just lines up so perfectly with Treffen, you know, go stomp it out for a weekend and then go and be among the witches leading the conversation. It's gonna be it's gonna be really neat. I love the not just the conversation that happened around the first one, but the understanding about the gender dynamics in the witchcraft communities. And I say communities plural because everyone's got their own piece of that that part that makes up a whole. Though we can interact and we can come together in common spaces, you notice a lot of that separation that happens, and it doesn't need to. So I would love to be able to make sure that we have space to bring that together. And luckily we get that from you. <laughs> Making space is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I had an exhibit last October... Yeah, last October. My goodness, yes. That was I was in the middle of bringing out my second book, Sacred Smoke, and an opportunity presented itself to join one of your many ventures. You want to tell us what, what we had going on? Well, uh, so me and the Cult of John, which is a group of interdisciplinary artists, decided that we needed to do a fringe festival event because we are smart people who like to pay lots of money. <laughs> So we did this Fringe Festival event at the Lysis Oasis, which involved human suspension, burlesque, and bouteau, which is a very expressive art form of modern dance. 
from Japan. Very, very gorgeous. It actually made the hair on my arm stand up. I have heard about the practice and the, the dance I had never experienced it, and you could hear a pin drop watching these artists create art with their bodies. It was incredible. And you not just you could hear a pin drop. I mean, everyone was leaning forwards in their seats, and they're experiencing dragging it all in. It's like there wasn't enough air in the room to see all of the art that was being exhibited. And that's that was just the inside space there was art hanging on the walls there's people interacting around there's a there's a bar available there were vendors i mean it's just a really neat space where a number of different groups and other different people were able to come together and say hey fringe is an opportunity to expand my horizon let's see what's up yeah no we like we were very impressed with the turnout and selling out that show um and as artists, I think that we were all really happy with the outcome. Uh, my partner, Tiv, was able to take a lot of really beautiful photos of this Aphrodite suspension and uh, Cupid suspension as well. And we were very pleased to have the opportunity to bring people into that space that hadn't necessarily heard of us or our traditions or even knew that there was a an occult lodge in their town. Exactly. It's If you don't know where it is, you don't know. And it's that way with just about everything. But if you've ever had the opportunity or the honor to be at a ritual where there was drawing down the moon, where there's someone aspecting uh, different the divine, being in that space and seeing Venus embodied in such a, a really impactful way, no one wanted to leave. It was just being in that space and that time there was this drawing out of your heart where you're waiting for her to say something and having the opportunity, I'm getting all misty, having the opportunity to speak to her about whatever you're dealing with. It was very private, it was very connected, and I will never forget it. I'm so glad that you were able to come. Uh, Yeah, Spooky just is an excellent channel and it was so glorious for for her and her and us to be able to have that that communion and the space really lends itself to that like everything that we've ended up doing there has um been imbued with something else in the best way it's it's incredible when you open the so the the way this room is set up you come into a sort of a warehouse space would you call it industrial law yeah and you Outside the lobby, it's an industrial loft space. There's offices, there's whatnot. But you open those doors and you know really powerful stuff happens behind, on the, uh, just on the other side of that door. And you can feel it. Whether you, you know, no matter what your origin, you can smell it, you can feel it, you can taste it. It's there. So, next question, my dear. I want to know what makes you feel the most magical? That is a really good question. Um, I think that right now, doing the invocation to Pan whenever uh, I get the opportunity really like leaves me with a great sense of personal power. Um, Almost as much as, like, after I do the Rite of the Phoenix. But in my personal practice, I think that those are the points that right now I feel the most magical. Though uh, participating in Gnostic Mass is definitely definitely up there. Yes. I believe they're feeling fuller than I came. And that's what, that's what any of us need. I mean, that's, that's all we're looking for. If you aren't familiar with the invocation of the Hymn to Pan, the experience is something you will never forget. Uh, Erie often does that during hex work. So perhaps if you show up, you might get a really incredible understanding of what she's talking about. I'm also starting to memorize Lieber Oz and change it a little bit to make it a little bit more more inclusive, a little bit, a little bit less aggro. 
Fantastic. I look forward to checking out what you're doing next this spring. Um, so what, this is usually kind of silly. What makes you feel the least magical? Dealing with money. Dealing with money is such a stressful contention, but also, you know, the basis of, of the currency of the realm. It's really, you know, unfortunate to see so many people that are so good at things on different planar levels, but, like, when we're, we're in the place of discs, it's just exhausting. It really is. Uh, I worked with a high priestess for a number of years, and the class, there was a cost associated because we were in this, we were in this gorgeous, round, uh, do-it-yourself building that was created as a yoga studio in a blueberry garden. Mm. It's gorgeous space, just blonde wood floors and celestite crystals at there's 12 windows and a big circle around you and it's spectacular space, but you couldn't hand money to her. You, there's a, there's a bowl up front, but there's so many people where money just takes you right out of your spiritual element where it sort of sucks some of that away because it's so planar. It's so of the earth that you're like, Oh, Hey, I want to be out in the ether. I'm going to be doing all this spiritual junk. And here is a, a weight to tire on your neck. Here's this thing that you have to have, have to do. So it's it's definitely, you're not alone in that. Yeah, working on my elemental rebalancing or at least telling myself that I'm trying to do that. But, you know, putting more hustle behind anything gives you a result and gives you an outcome. And I've uh, been, been focusing more on on that great mundane work. And it's starting to pay off. Fantastic. I mean being able to do our magical best to reach out and create those, those things is not something we value in ourselves. We can see it in other people. So that's, that's amazing. It's so easy to see awesome things in other people. Like you. <laughs> like you. <laughs> um, let's see. If you had one book to hand to somebody who knew absolutely nothing about what you do or what you did, what, how you interact with the divine, what would it be? You know, I'm going to be a real basic Thelemite here, and I'm just going to have to say the book of the law. Like, I feel like there are things about, like, just my work as a Thelemic witch and, like, my journey with magic and also to better understand modern magic. It's a really good thing to look at. That's fantastic. There, does the, oh, does Felicia still have the little pocket books? We do have little, a few little pocket books that are still left. We just sent a bunch of them down to our brothers and sisters in New Orleans where they're marching with a uh, crew Bohem. Ugh. Like their sub crew is called Crew With Thou Wilt. I love it so much. They're amazing. And people can come and march with them at any, like if you are going to be down there for the Mardi Gras season and you are, an, you know, able to, you know, you just hit up Crew Boheme, pay the big crew dues, and then the, the inner crew dues are like 25 or $30, and you can march around in costume and throw things at people <laughs> legally in New Orleans, drunk. That could be you. You should come next year because that will be me next year. Fantastic. It's going to be fun. I keep telling myself, this will be really amazing. I have not been to New Orleans yet, but it is definitely on my list, like way at the top. Yeah, you know, you could come there with uh, Ned and I and my partner, and I know that you would have super, so much fun in that company. I definitely would. You were all a fun bunch. What is next for you? Uh, next for me is hex work is starting back up. Um, I'm doing a little bit more in burlesque and just trying to continue seeing what's continue seeing what's manifesting. Uh, I'm very pleased with the work of the satanic temple in the mid-atlantic region i feel like the friends group friends of groups are taking it very seriously and starting to do a bunch of outreach and action which will end up paying off for our greater society in order to make it more secular an actual secular society or we all have to be able to play there's really no yeah and there's no one and done no one and done there's no no there's no saying that something else isn't a religion if we're going to be, if we're going to give money to religion. Here I am with my, cal with my cauldron out. Here I am with all of here. 
Here's all of these things that I'm doing. Please give me money. Reproductive freedom. Yes. Being able to provide sanitary products to women is huge. Uh, as a younger child for me, less well-to-do family, not knowing if you were going to have those products is such a huge thing. There's, there's shame that goes along with it. There's fear. There's, you already have a trillion hormones shooting through your body at light speed. All those other things, you know, you don't need it. Being able to donate those, you know, products to somewhere where you know it's going to go to a real person rather than just handing money to an organization you don't know how they spend it. The work that uh, the Friends of Groups is, are doing, so great. What can you tell someone who has heard about something that the uh, Friends of Groups are doing, but they, they're confusing like Church of Satan and... and uh, well, the TST, it does trace its origins back to the Church of Satan, and that has come out now, and they are, in fact, you know, Satanists with satanic practice, but also mainly atheists, and find value in ritual. I would suggest going to seeing a uh, Friends of Group meetup, which they all have to have monthly, and start getting involved in, like, the community outreach level. Like, we're going to start doing some cleanups in New Jersey that are on the docket. Maybe we can do some in Delaware, too. The Delaware group is getting bigger every day? Yeah, um, and their organizer is very se- taking this very seriously, and uh, I think that the work they did with the Georgetown State House was wonderful, and the solstice, you know, completely, perfectly nonviolent, just hanging out being weird while you guys are being weird, just all of us being weird and religious together, you know, set a really nice example. Yes, and it, I was really tickled that it made national news, the, that everyone got along. Usually when things like this happen, they're just waiting for something to go terribly, terribly wrong, so they have a great headline, and instead, everyone gets along. A Satanist and a nativity scene can totally live side by side without it being a big deal. Like, it's, this is what America should be about. Yes. This is literally what we are supposed to be about. Seeing Hail Satan last fall was definitely one of the highlights of my year. Being able to understand... I'm, I'm more familiar with the Satanic Temple because I've had really amazing friends and I have a, a good network, but really seeing not just the genesis, but some of the ideas that they were putting out in... The documentary itself, I can't. It's like the this right of friendship. Like, come and watch this movie with me. Come and watch this documentary, um, because it's it. There is that personal connection. Everyone finds that piece of themselves in what they're talking about. And as a secular organization trying to balance the, you know, we're we were approved as a religion, but this is a secular group, and it's such a great balance for everybody to come together and say, look, everybody wants these certain things and my favorite being reproductive autonomy it's so easy right reproductive autonomy that means that you get to do what you want with your body (sighs) being able to have the freedom of self the freedom of conscience to do the things with your body that you need to do there's nothing like it you know i'm i'm Someone, you know, someone says, oh, so-and-so's a nut about this or that. I'm a bodily autonomy nut. I want everybody to do what they need to do with their own bodies, and let's leave them alone about it. I am, I am totally on board with you with that. Yes. 100%. So, I want to ask you, you know, everyone asks how they, how did you find your way to magic? I want to ask you, is there anything that could have dissuaded you from your community? That could have taken you away or even had you walk away? So uh, my community and my life changes to the course of my growth. So um, there have been times in the past where I've had different community or, you know, at times it was necessary for me to leave a tradition that I was working with and give it some time to, to percolate in the background and eventually worked my way back around to it. Um, that definitely happened with me with the OTO, but I've always been a fairly solitary magician who occasionally teams up for celebrations with people that overall didn't 
join a coven or engage a lot with the overall magical community in any of the areas that I was living in. That was really well put. In bouncing around from traditions and magical practice, I had a lot of that because I, I found magic as an 11-year-old. You know, I'm, I'm sneaking across the floor like the Pink Panther trying to sneak Cunningham's Guide to Wicca out of my sister's book bag and read it by the light of the gas lights down the street. The minute I turned 18, the very second I ran to the nearest witchy store and joined the first coven I could find. Never do that. Don't do, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like fun. That says, I'm going on an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely an adventure. Um, I don't necessarily, I don't, what's the word? I don't regret my path to where to getting where I am today um, but I definitely if you decide that you are interested in looking at a coven if you want to look at group work there's the difference between covens and magical working groups but date around you know interview them as much as they're interviewing you and figure out where you fit and I guarantee you just because you think there's only one coven in your area I bet you there's more um, I ran into Baltimore <laughs> thinking there was only one coming. I guarantee you there, I was, I was very wrong. So wrong. But there's that idea that covens are, should have your back and they should nurture you to help you grow. So if you don't have the right one, it's going to feel like you're wearing a wool sweater that's three sizes too small. So if you have any doubts if you have any feelings about it run <laughs> I mean working with people just in general just being around people can sometimes be hard like yes never mind you know breaking down like energetic barriers and allowing people to have access to a very intimate part of yourself and expression uh, is not anything to be taken lightly uh, it's I mean boundaries are important but be careful be careful about who you who you join up those energies with. Like, you know, have safe sex and enjoy yourself. But like magic, you want to really think about that stuff before you start engaging in it with other people, in my opinion. Absolutely. When you're, when there's an established group, there's something called an egregor, the group mind of the group. That's almost like its own ghost of the, the energy of this coven. And when you bring a new person in each time, it changes it a little bit. And that can cause friction or it can make the group better as a whole. But you never really know going in what's going to happen, how that's going to shake out. Um, I, have, I have my witchy people and I have my heathen people. And some of, those, some of those things are a Venn diagram and some of those things are the outside edges of that circle. But every time you bring in a new person, you have to figure out in remaking your worldview and remaking that coven's group mind... It's got to be someone that's worth disturbing that equilibrium that's already been established. So this isn't, you know, somebody shows up one day and says, this looks neat. Let me in. That's not how it works. And it's not elitism. It's caution for everyone in that group because everyone is exposing the most intimate parts of themselves. You know, one of the very first, oh, one of the very first things that I did with my first coven was an incredibly traumatic working and it was it was designed that way it was something I designed it was something I needed um, but it was me and my high priestess and her right hand woman but no one else there's you want to take time when you're exposing those your delicate fleshy underbelly <laughs> soft belly meats so yes if you want to if you want to join a group find people that not only understand who you are, but really vibe with where you're going. I think that's that's a great takeaway. Definitely. I'm like, what kind of work are they doing? Like, who are they doing work for? Like, is this a celebratory coven? Is this a coven that's, like, spell-obsessed? Are these people with a lot of, like, psychic baggage? You know, really, really take a look at who you're getting yourself involved with. Absolutely. How do they treat new people? How do they, how soon, do, I mean, what are the requirements for you to be able to join? How do they handle it when someone leaves? Often tells you a lot more about the group than what they're telling you about how to get in. 
Definitely. Oh, definitely listen to the way that people talk. Because if they talk about other people in certain ways, you should be pretty sure that they're talking about you. Absolutely. Those group politics. It's difficult. It's one of the things that I think makes it the hardest to reach out and be vulnerable in looking at joining a group. It's driving more people away from group work is the fear of that. You know, the, not just group politics, but allowing themselves to, to show any of that vulnerability in working with a friend of mine who is putting together a book proposal. I'm trying to help her understand what it is that publishers are looking for in their proposal. And I had to, I had a, I had like a stroke of genius just come from the blue and say, you know what? When I was first writing my first proposal for my very first book, I wanted, I wanted to cite everything. I wanted to be able to have everything laid out and here's 37 dots and pieces and Here's validation of what I'm doing. And I had to stop. Like, validation's going to come from me, or it's not. But no matter how many citations you have, it's not going to give you that validation. You have to work on it yourself. And being able to make yourself vulnerable to another person is what people respond to. They don't respond to 37 citations. They just sort of start drifting over those. They respond to the vulnerability they, they see in someone else. They, if they think you're perfect, then they're turned off and they, they run the other way. We don't, nobody's perfect, but if you think you're perfect, there might, there might be some issues. <laughs> um, but it's so neat to be able to show that little bit of vulnerability that says, yeah, I'm a person. I see that you are a person too. Let's be people at the same time in the same place. It seems like a lot of these... Uh witch groups on the internet are fostering that which is nice like in Philadelphia we have the city witch group which is for people that are in Philly and around and beyond uh, you know even if you're not necessarily looking for people to do witchcraft with it's always nice to have other occulty friends yeah they have great just networking they have the ability to say hey this is something I thought about you can bounce ideas off other people they have a really handy list that keeps being updated for when there's something that could be available, could be of interest to witchy people in the area. You know, when the Philadelphia Pagan Pride event comes out, when the there's other events that are happening in the area. Oh, the Lost Curio Market is coming up on August 22nd at the Philadelphia Armory, and that's going to be amazing. I'm looking forward to that. My, my next jaunt into Philadelphia is definitely looking like going to be the 8th, where I'm going to check out Blood Milk Jewels next out event uh, um, at Snakeskin, I think is the name of the venue. I cannot wait to see that venue. All the all things that they've been doing there have just looked like so much fun, and the branding is beautiful, and of course I'm wearing my one blood milk piece that I got through Death and Taxes the other, la- other year, and I see that you are also wearing a different blood milk piece because, you know, like fancy you witches. <laughs> fancy witches. Fancy witches. Hashtag fancy witches. I mean, uh, it's true. She does really incredible work. Um, you can find bloodmilkjewels.com. She is so... The ring that I'm wearing right now, as a matter of fact, is part of their lover's collection. There's two itty-bitty snakes. Uh, it turns out that there was a small snake that died in her garden. And so she did a life casting of this tiny little baby. So he could live forever. Aww. So there's two snakes intertwined, and they're actually holding a crown... Uh, that's inset with uh, a round cut moonstone. Aww. And this lovely little sweet baby will live forever. You can actually see the little segments in his head and those really beautiful details that say, this is not a sculpture. This is this was a real living thing. Um, I have her Hecate ring in Labradorite. And the setting is cast bat bones. You know, she does has such an incredible eye when it talks about creating natural based settings, pieces, art. It's its really incredible. She's she does some amazing things. Yeah, those Art Nouveau lines, like the flowing lines of the new the new Bellflower and collection, like it's just very, it's very distinct that it looks very similar to, um, and similar as inspired by a lot of Art Nouveau pieces, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, the Datura Bell uh, in two sizes, and there's a Datura Bell or the Belladonna Bell to go with it. And it's just the teeniest little thing, or it's a lovely arch piece. She makes the, the chains that go with it. It's 
that is jewelry that makes you feel like a witch. I, I'm definitely not one to describe that there's one way to do it, but that's that's definitely on my list. Perfume and jewelry. Oh, uh, yes, the VPAL and, and blood milk. Ooh, that would be nice if they did a collaboration sometimes. I'm they do. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yes. Oh, yeah, Sphere and Sundry? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, blood Milk Jewels actually just did some releases of Black Phoenix Alchemy Labs perfumes for Blood Milk Jewels. If you go to their website, there's a lot, there's one that I'm really in love with. It's called Old Books. Mm. And it just has that vanilla paper, leather, gorgeousness happening. I need, I need 12 bottles. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds amazing. I can't wait to come over and give it the sniff test. So... I am, I'm just, I'm just loving that ability to reach out, connect, and talk to other people. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? Uh, I just want to say that you should definitely hit that subscribe button and see what else is going to be coming out from the fine folks. The fine folks at Dorks and Forks, Geek Culture, and Food Porn, because who doesn't need both good cultural references and food pornography? And witchcraft. And now witchcraft. Yes. So... Please do us a favor and like and subscribe. Uh, next week, we'll have more guests, more book reviews, more maybe some independent artists, and witchcrafting community. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah.